Hello, it's the 20th of May here in Australia, uh, 19th of May in the USA and Europe. So for those people I'm calling from your future. Um, this is episode 73 of the Unseen Podcast. The Unseen Podcast is an unedited, uncensored, open participation spin-off of the WOW Podcast. You can get more information on that at wowpodcast.com. My name is David Grigg and I'm your host today. We have a special guest today, Madison Campbell, who is researching the virology of space and, let me see if I can pronounce this correctly, epidemiological <laughs> principles in large colonization efforts. Say hello, Madison. Hi, everyone. So glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. A pleasure. And we're also joined by Paul Carr, who is the founder of this, of this uh, wonderful podcast. Oh, well, so, hello, everybody. <laughs> So, Madison, we're fascinated by your uh, topic of study. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about it and perhaps how you decided to start researching uh, the virology of space? Yeah, so um, I'll kind of start how I got started in epidemiology and then how I transitioned into being interested in space. So my background in research is actually in neuroepidemiology. So um, for my first kind of two years when I started Epi, I really focused on Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. So specifically mathematical modeling of the progression of Alzheimer's. So I looked at amyloid plaque formation buildup um, and different levels where we could essentially say, hey, this is the time where we could employ protective factors. Um, and then I kind of made a calculation to where we would employ these protective factors. Obviously, there's no cure for Alzheimer's right now um, and kind of getting to it early at mild cognitive um, impairment is very difficult. So that was what my research focused on. I had no really experience in space. I had interest. I was like, you know, a Star Trek, Star Wars fan, things like that. But that was kind of it. I really didn't see, you know, I, I have a lot of friends that are interested and were interested from like the NASA mission specifically and have been following the human research roadmap a lot more closely than I have, but I kind of just fell into it. So when Elon Musk announced um, about his inter um, transport system to Mars in September of last year, I became very interested because I thought that, you know, what Elon is saying is so inspirational um, and what he's trying to do is so amazing. But as an epidemiologist, it's very, very scary because, you know, we've been saddled with every mission that we've kind of created has been six to eight people. Six to eight people, you can kind of control for a lot of things. But whenever Elon stepped up and he said, oh yeah, a hundred people. As an epidemiologist, I'm like, okay, well, this is very scary because, you know, if a disease hits two people, that's not that bad. You can contain that. When it hits 15 people, it's a lot difficult, you know, it's a lot more difficult to contain. And so I got very interested in, you know, asking the people at NASA, hey, do you have an epidemiologist kind of looking at these problems that the commercial space industry is going through? Because I think that it's going to be a huge problem that no one's really addressing right now. Mm -hmm. um, everyone that I talk to says, yeah, there's no epidemiologist that we know of that is addressing large scale problems that could happen on board. And so I wanted to take my epidemiology background and kind of mutate that into taking, you know, everything from space. So within about a six month time span, I had to kind of catch up to where everyone else was in terms of their knowledge from the missions, basically, you know, from everything NASA has done from the 50s onward. Um, and see kind of where the research was. And the one glaring thing that I kept seeing um, was something about dormant viruses. So one of the big, the biggest problems that NASA is having, and there's a researcher, Dwayne Pearson at NASA, he just retired. But one of the things that he had been primarily researching is um, the shingles uh, virus. Mm -hmm. So because you think about it, there is more people that were never, um, never got the vaccine for chicken pox that were on the early missions um, to the moon and things like that, the Apollo missions. So um, one of the biggest problems is people were having symptoms of shingles when they were on board. So rashes and things like that. 
And so, you know, this researcher, Dwayne Pearson, was asking, well, why are people having this reactivated, um, you know, virus? It should be fine. On Earth, it's fine. Then why is it happening whenever we send people, you know, to the moon or we send people to the ISS? So they kind of found out under the stressors of space. So under the stressors of microgravity, radiation, specifically galactic cosmic radiation, as well as um, just microgravity, that kind of irritates your immune system. So these reactivated viruses um, that on Earth are perfectly fine, you, you know, every day, 95% of the world, for instance, with Epstein-Barr, um, lives their life, no problems. But because, um, you know, going on these missions are so awful to your immune system in so many ways, that these reactivated viruses can cause a huge, big problem. So that's kind of where I got interested in it because it has an epidemiological, um, epidemiological perspective in terms of if we have widespread, you know, a virus mutation amongst crew members, this could be potentially detrimental to our crew. So that's kind of where I got started. And that's, that's where I currently am. And there's still so many problems that are left unanswered, but it's an amazing problem to be studying. That's, that's fascinating. Um, I, because I suppose one of my first questions, which you've already answered, was uh, really the assumption, I suppose, is that we're sending people off to, to, uh, to space or another planet and we screen them for medical conditions and so on. Um, but we're not likely to get viruses. Um, uh, we're not likely to be affected by viruses from you know, poultry or, or cattle and so on, which is, the, which is a source of viruses on Earth. Um, because you don't, you're not going to have those animals up, uh, in space. Um, but what you're, you're saying really is that we have to really worry about viruses which people already have, which, we, which are unseen, but which yeah. under the stress of space can, um, can reactivate. Yeah, and, and that's what people don't realize, right? So, you know, there's a certain amount of testing that astronauts go through where they are put in for a certain amount of time to make sure that they don't have like a flu or things like that. But because 95% of the adult population has Epstein-Barr, we can't really start saying, oh, you know what, you have Epstein-Barr, you can't come, because everyone does, you know? Mm -hmm. Practically, there's no really even sample populations that I've been able to find that doesn't have Epstein-Barr to be able to say, oh, well, let's see if, you know, if we potentially send them or put them under an analog population where they're not, you know, they're under the same stressors of space, but they don't have Epstein-Barr, what kind of happens to them? But we can't even find that population because it's so widespread. And that's kind of the problem. We can't run a typical case control study like we would in any other, you know, cancer study where we have people that are non-cancerous versus cancerous or people that have a virus versus people that don't. Because our samples are all, you know, virus carriers. Can you tell me a, a bit more about... Um... You know, Epstein-Barr, I've, I've heard of it, but I, I know almost nothing yeah. about it. So most people know Epstein-Barr is mononucleosis, the virus that causes mononucleosis. So the majority of people um, get it. It's called the kissing disease. So it's um, a droplet disease. So anything via saliva, water, um, things like that, or even it's kind of gross. But, you know, if you touch anywhere near your mouth or nostrils and things like that and touch something else and then somebody touches that, it transfers there. So what's interesting about Epstein-Barr, not only does it cause mononucleosis, which you might not be concerned about mononucleosis, right? It makes you kind of um, tired and, you know, a little have a headache and maybe a little bit of a fever, but it's, it's not that bad. Um, the problem is, is Epstein-Barr was actually found as the first cancer virus. Um, it was found in Burkitt's lymphoma, and it's since been found in tons of different um, esophageal cancer um, and uh, some spleen cancers and things like that. So what we're more concerned about is the carcinogenesis um, of Epstein-Barr, because we don't really care if people get mono. Um, it also causes cataracts, but that's also something that's easily fixable. What we cause about, uh, what we really care about is the fact that individuals could get cancer very rapidly because the, you know, the problems on space are so different than the problems on Earth. Or even, you know, saying, okay, well, you go on the space mission, 
maybe you, you know, come back to earth and then you have cancer in 10 years, which could be a huge problem as well. Mm. That's interesting. So, um, it's, as you say, it's not something which really has been thought about. I studied uh, the idea that we um, um, go to Mars and uh, we, we take a number of people with us, but we, we may not be able to sustain that for any great length of time because if you're there for 10 years, perhaps you might get a, a rash of cancers appearing. I mean, what, what are the odds of that that cause of cancer being more than the radiation that you would so, be subjected to in, in the travel? Right. So it's, that's a tough question to ask. Um, so it depends on a lot of factors. One of the things that I've been focusing my research on is um, solar cycles, actually, and the amount of galactic cosmic radiation and solar energy particles, solar storms that happen. Because actually, it depends on what solar cycle we are, if we're in a solar minimum or maximum when we travel. Because, for instance, when you're on a certain solar cycle, you'll get X amount of radiation, but you'll get 10 times more if you're on, you know, a different year. So um, it's going to depend on when we send people off. And it could be the problem that we say, hey, we might not be able to send people for five years because they'll be exposed to too much radiation. Um, and then there's the problem of this. So if we go during a certain period of time, say during a solar minimum, then we, so you'll be exposed to more radiation while, um, or sorry, less radiation on your way to Mars. But when you're on Mars, you might, kind of like the Martian, you might be in a solar storm where you'll get so much radiation packed in such a small amount of time, kind of very similar to like, you know, Hiroshima or Nagasaki, where you would die almost instantaneously, which is almost a problem. You almost would rather get more radiation the chance that while you're on Mars, you get one blast and you're dead. <laughs> yeah, that's not good. <laughs> no, not good. I know. But yeah, so it depends on a lot of different things. It also depends on your age. People that are younger um, can't take a lot of exposure to radiation, um, specifically galactic cosmic radiation, versus people that are older. Um, so in theory, it would actually be more beneficial for us to send older people on the first mission to Mars than younger people because they can withstand the um, levels of radiation. So basically, over the years, you have a higher uh, accumulation level that you can have of radiation. Um, so if we were to send anybody over 40, it would be much better than people that are 20. But then you talk about like bone loss, right, in terms of sending you like Scott Kelly, um, and all the research that has been done on Scott Kelly since he spent a year in space. Um, and it's detrimental for, you know, people that are older to go into space for other reasons. But on the cancer side, they might be okay. You know, it's just kind of balancing what risk do you really want to take. Sure. It, well, I suppose really what that's saying to me is that um, we can go on missions in space, but the idea of setting up some sort of permanent colony is pretty unlikely, isn't it? Unless we have much better ways of, um, of screening and also dealing with the issues that, you, that you're that you studying in terms of the the hidden viruses that we may take with us. Um, so, uh, I mean, one, one has this, um, you know, uh, very optimistic idea of, of let's all go to Mars and start a colony there and have babies and uh, and uh, build cities there. It's it's sounding um, pretty unlikely. Uh, I mean, on, on, one, from a health point of view, from a health point of view, it is unlikely for many reasons, not only the viruses, but one of the biggest things that you know engineers are focusing on is specifically you know the materials we use to block those specific radiation. So up to a certain amount, we can block X amount of radiation exposure, but we haven't gotten past that threshold where it's actually going to be beneficial to our health. And this is, this is a good thing and a bad thing. So a lot of the commercial space industries put all of their money into engineering, you know, like, oh, we have to build a better shield or we have to build a better rocket to get there, which is good because we kind of need that to minimize the risk of radiation. But at the same time, all these commercial space industries are not accounting for, hey, you know, let's just say our shields don't work. Let's just say that the materials we've built 
are not protecting our crew. What do we do then? Like there's no, um, you know, the people that they contract out for space medical type things, um, specifically at SpaceX, it's the only example I know of, are all consultants out of either NASA or the Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and to me, it's just like, why don't you hire a staff in-house to be looking at these things? Because if you're going to send 100 people up, you're a commercial space entity. You know, there is money on the line. There's stockholders, you know, giving you money to make the mission successful. Why aren't you focusing into the health of the people you're sending? Well, of course, I mean, there, apart from the the, the, uh, the stockholders, there's a huge ethical issue here, isn't there? Um, uh, what, what is your ethical position if you, you're knowingly sending people off into a um, uh, hazardous situation that um, you haven't thoroughly researched? Uh, that's, uh, that, that's a pretty big... Well, uh, big and are, are there historical analogies here? Um, for example, uh, my ancestors came to America crammed aboard a tiny, you know, sailing ship from England and uh that they took certainly took some risks uh not as many risks as the people that were already living here were taking <laughs> by encountering mm -hmm. them but uh the uh you know, they they certainly took a lot of risks coming over here this was this was in the 17th century when it was a lot safer than it was in the you know in the in the 16th century but still uh you wonder, uh, you know, there's a risk profile that that's tolerable and one that's not. And I don't know where the tolerable profile is. Hit. I don't know if we even have a unified model for what the risks are. No, it's it seems to me that there's the distinction though between sending an adult volunteer. Um, who uh, believes that they understand the risks that they're, they're taking. Um, there's a distinction between that and the idea of when those people get there, they start having children and the children are not volunteers. Um, they are not aware of the risks. Um, and uh, so uh, even you know, the, the ethical considerations of that, I think, are pretty big. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm having a lot of trouble with the idea of, of where we, how we get from where we are now to the science fictional idea of yes, let's go to to Mars and and have babies and build build a, another human colony there, which will be a backup for uh, our civilization here on Earth. And, well, and I'm actually quite quite interested in that whole idea of how you actually could actually get to. A self-sustaining colony that would work. Well, we, we uh, talked about this. Uh, I, I don't think you were on that particular episode, but uh, we did talk about uh, the fact that well, it's not a fact. I shouldn't say the fact that uh, the, the speculation that uh, anybody who goes to Mars to settle and raise a family is going to have to bring some genetic tools with them besides their own bodies. They're going to have to have a way of engineering their children to be more robust to the Martian environment. Uh, and uh, now, of course, no one is more sensitive to the risks to a child than the, the parents of that child. Uh, so I think a lot of people would, a lot of the first settlers won't have children. It, it will take I think a while. that's, I mean, Women's women's health epidemiologists have been talking about this, or more specifically anthropologists. But you know, bringing children. There's actually a sci-fi movie that just came out about that. We just we have no idea what the health problems are of having a child, and there's there's really no specific protocol that we've laid out either. You know, NASA has not laid out, ESA has not laid out anything, and so we. We don't have this protocol to say, even if we were to make a colonization, what would we do um, if these, if somebody was pregnant or if, you know, X, Y, Z happened? And I think that's one of the biggest problems that NASA is starting to realize is, you know, Mars 2020 becomes more of a reality every day is the fact that we don't have these, this protocol to say, what are we going to do? And, and the people that I talk to that I ask, well, what would you do if, X person 
had, you know, some sort of problem or EBV related virus or another virus. And they're like, oh, just send them off the ship. Like, you know, open the airlock and say goodbye. And I'm like, yeah, well, I don't think that's going to work either. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, it, it would work, but uh, <laughs> I don't know <laughs> if, if people would find that an acceptable option. Yeah. But but it, it is an issue. If you um, if you did have, say, a, a virus that mutated and you had a, a, an immediately lethal uh Version, you know, version of flu or whatever that that um, that started up somehow. Um, as you say, with a very small number of people, it, it's you're not very unlikely that a small colony would survive survive that. And there's no real way of, of protecting against that, is there? If, if it's possible, we could take our viruses with us. Yeah, well, it is risky, but I mean, what are the odds that the particular virus that we carry are going to mutate in something deadly? Well, it's possible, isn't it? Oh, it's possible, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, 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 it's very, the reason, I mean, yeah, not to be like, oh, but I mean, that's the reason why I got into EBP is because, you know, so specifically the analog populations we've looked at in terms of stress, um, other than astronauts, because all the data that I have is basically on the shingles virus. So the data on EBV that actually has been looked at has been in like people um, getting ready for finals, right? So, you know, the stress getting ready for finals is, is incredibly tumultuous and things like that. So these college age students will go through um, heightened levels of EBV and actually get related like mononucleosis, cataracts, similar cataract like symptoms and things like that. And so that's kind of where we've seen even only one factor without radiation, without microgravity, only being stressed out about like finals and you can imagine the immense stress of starting a colonization being alone being away from everything you know only finals has caused this heightened level of disease and infection what what's going to happen whenever you're have all of this stress on your back in terms of making it work mm. oh. <laughs> That's what I like to compare it to. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's 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 pretty interesting, isn't it? Okay. Well, now, well, so, do we have do we have any models that we can use? I mean, obviously, you know, the several of the Apollo astronauts were under a lot of stress, but they were only there for in, in transit for a few days. Um, so we we we've seen heightened. Um, so we have collected data on EBV, and we see heightened levels. But Scott Kelly is a population of one for over a year mission. A Mars mission, if we're doing a, um, a mission that goes and returns, would be approximately three years. We have no representative data. The only data that we can use is submariner and Antarctic populations, but even those populations don't go under the same stressors of um, a trip to Mars. And in Scott Kelly, I mean, we have decent data that we've collected, specifically genomic data, but that's re recently new. We haven't been able to kind of parse through it yet. And yet again, it's a population of one. What can we really do with that? Mm. Well, wasn't the, wasn't but, the attraction of Scott Kelly that he had an identical twin who yes. uh, was yeah. on the ground? So you could, uh, you could see what you could, you could sort of, fa you could factor out genetic issues, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. Are there, are there yeah. Paul talked about his ancestors coming to America. Um, are there good historical analogs? Not so much people coming to America where there was quite a decent population fairly soon, I think. Um, I'm thinking of perhaps Iceland, the the, um, the the Vikings arriving in Iceland and so on. Are, are there, is there any useful um, comparisons we can do with, with those sort of situations where people are leaving their home a long way behind and, Ending up in a quite a small pop population on a on a fairly rugged um, in a fairly rugged environment. Are they, are they useful? And do we know anything about the uh, the the epidemio epi I can't say that word <laughs> epidemiology of, of the Viking population in Iceland? Um, I I think that I mean honestly, up until right now, I didn't think about it from that standpoint. Um, which is really good because it has my mind going. But at the same time, I would say to you, you know, 
one of the things we're looking for is a, so the magic value that is probably going to end up being like my life's goal until I can figure it out and then it'll be something else is the threshold value of reactivation. So what we essentially want to know is, so say you were to get X amount of x-rays, how many x-rays or how much dose of radiation would you have to get to have reactivated EBV that would turn into cancer, right? Because if we, if we knew that value, then we say, oh, well, just, you know, get 10 less than that value or just don't hit that value. But because we don't know that value, we have no idea um, what that reactivation level is. So I would say, while that would be really good, we, we don't know what stressors other than, you know, stress itself of leaving your home and moving to another, they were undergoing, was it food? Um, I mean, there's been like, specifically in like, travelers to Antarctica, like problems with food has also caused a lot of health problems. So in order for and you know a case control study or a cohort study to do really well, we have to get rid of the confounding, and we have to make sure that the levels that we're looking at is specifically stress um, due to like mission success or mission failure, radiation and microgravity. Um, and at least if we can get mission success or failure, which we can see through like you know the Navy going to um, having a submariner mission, specifically the Nemo missions are what we use. That would be great, but other than that, it's just really hard to find an analog. Mm. Mm. Well, yeah, I mentioned it's it's difficult with the historical because you just don't have any virological data. I mean, like the Polynesians did this hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, right? They traveled in small groups over the open ocean for a very long time until they hit. They found an island, then they settled on that island uh, in small groups. But we don't have any idea what kind of diseases they had or how they how well they weathered them. Yeah, yeah. It would it would actually be an interesting historical analysis. Yeah, well, I, I know that in the um, there are Viking uh, settlements in uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, but it wasn't quite the same because there was already a population of the Anglo-Saxons there. But um, I know that they've done a lot of studies with places like York, which was a Viking city, um, where they've been able to study the um, uh, the cesspits, basically, the um, and and from from what they find there, determine what the um, uh, the diet and so on of the of the people. Uh, living there was was like in the time, but uh, I don't know that there's much in the way of learning about the diseases from that. But do you, do you, anyone know? I, I, I don't. don't. Know. Yeah, no, I I haven't specifically. So, in terms of historical epidemiology, my background is very little because I mean the majority of things that we're looking at is a really great analog that we can use right now or in the past 10 years. Because like David was saying again, um, you know, we need that data that we just don't have from looking years and years ago that we can't collect. Mm. Um, you know, we can't collect it from bones, um, which would be great if we could to go back and say, oh, well, this person might likely have suffered from this virus. But we we have to extract that from blood or, you know, from mm. other, other not so great, um, you know, different collection methods. But that's essentially would be the problem is we don't have that collection to kind of make a historical analysis of, oh, well, this, you know, is something that happened. Um, you know, maybe we'll just do what they did so they don't die. Mm. But, yeah. But I suppose, um, I suppose then we're, what we're left with is actually doing the experiment of um, sending a whole bunch of people to Mars and seeing what happen, which happens to them. But uh, I say there are some ethical considerations that uh, you have to take into account about that. But it's, it seems likely that we're going to do that anyway, doesn't it? I think someone's going to try to to uh, send people to Mars for an extended period of time. Yeah, um, and those people, and we'll, well, those people will be well aware that they're taking a lot of... We, you know, we talked to the uh, some of the Mars, the Mars One candidates. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I had the impression that they were pretty clear on what the risks were to them. Uh, and weren't they planning not to come back? That wasn't the whole... Well, yeah, I don't think anybody's planning to come back. It, it, 
you 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 go to Mars and and you stay there. Uh, you know, you're going to die somewhere. Uh, dying uh, <laughs> dying on Mars might not be such a bad option. That that may be true, but 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 um, I think that the um, the risks that those people think of are probably more along the lines of you know having your helmet helmet breach while you're outside in the um, in the in the very little air or <coughs> excuse me um, they, they don't think of um, dying of cancer while they're young while they're there. Do you think do you think that was one of the things that they were aware yeah, of? That, yeah, they, they're, 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 there 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 isn't. Although I have to say there isn't a a ton of data on exposure to low low levels of radiation over a long time as opposed to high levels of radiation over a short time. Uh, we but, do know what happens if you have right. high, high levels of radiation over a short time. It's very mm. bad for you, right? Mm. <laughs> uh, we know that from, <laughs> from Chernobyl, yeah. from places yeah, like, you know. But we don't know. Uh, it's really just not... I mean, not even good animal data. I think uh, you know what happens to people. No, no. But but you, but you see, the, the, you, you you probably have again. I'm just sort of thinking about it from the optimistic science fictional point of view that you see in a lot of novels. <laughs> the the um, you you think, oh well, we're going to protect ourselves against radiation, and so we'll have better shielding, and we'll we'll live underground, or or, or you know, some means of protecting ourselves against radiation. You don't think of the things that, that Madison's looking at of, well, even if you do all that shielding, you may still come down with an unexpected cancer because your Epstein-Barr virus is reactivated. That's that's really quite new. I haven't seen that covered in, in yeah, science. Yeah, I have to admit that that's something I haven't heard about before. Well, I'm, I'm glad. It makes me excited to talk about it. Um, I, you know, this has been one of my problems and interests about studying a very odd field. I mean, not only is space odd and people will come up to you and say, oh, wow, you're you're doing something for the Mars missions. Are you an engineer? And I'm like, no, I'm not. Um, you know, because it immediately goes to human factor engineering. And I'm like, no, not, not human factor engineering. And then once you tell them, you know, space viruses, they're like, what? Like, no such thing exists. I mean, there are probably five or six people in the entire world that even have looked at it in their life, and uh, three of those people have retired. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's not that popular. No one really knows about it, and it is a really, really big problem. Well, yeah. it's a terrific field to research then, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, now, yeah, I have, I have to tell you, you know, as an engineer myself, we don't like squishy things like viruses. Uh, uh, if you mention squishy things, we we want we want you know to find a, a medical doctor somewhere who will just deal with that for us. So, Give us a pill. Mm. yeah, or a pill or a, or a, a shot or you know, and then it's done, right? So uh, there is a bit of a bias there, right? Uh, engineer, uh, th there's a gap between what engineers do and what the medical profession and the health profession and bio, you know, biological sciences do and the, a gap that's probably going to have to close before we can be successful at Mars. So I agree. I mean, the, the person who got me into this was actually um, an engineer. He interned at SpaceX. Now he's actually working. He's some executive director at Snapchat, but um, he was the one who got me into it, and he solely focused on the engineering problems. And we talked, I mean, it was a really great kind of friendship that I had with him, or still have, because we were able to say, oh, from an engineering standpoint. So from an engineering standpoint, the things that we talked about were, okay, if there was an infection or if there was need for quarantine, how could you engineer a solution that would close off X amount of portion of a spaceship to kind of quarantine those people so they don't get everybody else sick, especially if it is um, easily transferable through the air because it obviously works on an air filtration system, constantly you know, circulating and um, refiltering the air. How would you close that off from an engineering standpoint if that infection was to happen? And obviously, we need an epidemiologist, not to toot my own horn, you know, hire me, hire me, um, to work with an engineer to say, 
if we do need to create quarantine uh, mechanisms, how do we do that? Um, you know, on a spaceship with limited capacity to send X amount of people, especially when you're dealing with the very, very small spaces, um, so they don't get the rest of the crew sick. Hmm. Well, let me ask you about the space station, uh, International Space Station. Typically have six people up there at a given time. Uh, are we learning anything from that? Um, in terms of Epstein Barr, in terms of well, in terms of any uh, infectious disease or or virus, we we've been we've been fairly lucky because no one really is other than Scott Kelly has been up there for any extended amount of time. The every time somebody comes down with even like a small rash or something like that, they're immediately sent down to Earth. Um, you know, we we don't really let anything happen. Um, so there's a guy who ended up getting a rash that we found out was, um, I'm pretty sure it was related to the shingles virus, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Um, and the person had red spots all over their chest and all over their arms. We sent that person back immediately. So we, we have data from virus, like elevated levels. Um, but other than kind of having that like blood data and things like that from seeing the elevated levels of EVB and shingles, um, uh, the shingles virus and other viruses like that, we, we can't really say that there's been that much of a problem. But yet again, we're dealing with a, a different time scale and we're dealing with a very small population. The thing is, it's so close to us that uh, it's not, not such a big deal to, to send them back. Uh, as you say, immediately. I mean, immediately, presumably, is when there's next day, uh, uh, when, when there's a, a vehicle to send them back in. Um, if you're um, if you're on uh, the moon or you're on Mars, um, you can't simply do that. So you're going to have to put them in a in a hut somewhere or something. What you know? How how, how could you cope with that? Yeah, and this this is where I have my engineering friends say, put them in the airlock, say goodbye. I'm like, oh, this can't do that. <laughs> well, you say you can't do that, but but um, in in um, in an extreme situation, unfortunately, they probably would. Um, yeah. It reminds me of that that classic science fiction story, the cold equations. Are you familiar with that? I'm not, but uh, it's, uh, it's it's a yeah. classic. It's a classic of the genre, but basically, there's a it's set on a spaceship, and this uh, the 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 soul pilot on board discovers there's a stowaway and uh who's a woman and i can't remember why she stows away um but uh he knows that there's not enough air uh not enough oxygen and not enough supplies uh, too much mass all sorts of reasons uh that that he, the voyage can't continue with her on board and so it's this whole ethical thing of you know does he go out the airlock or does he push her out the airlock? And I honestly can't remember now how the story ends up, but it, it, it's the cold equations are, sorry, this, the, the equations say this is it. You, we, you know, we may be sorry about it, but it, it's the fact is that the numbers say this. You, you, can't, you can't argue with the numbers. Or the needs uh, of the uh, many uh, outweigh the needs of the few. <laughs> well, it, it, it would be practically that, I think, in a Martian colony or, or even in a spaceship, you know, you'd, you'd, have to, you'd, have to, um, you'd have to be sorry about it, but you'd have to do it, I think. Don't you think? Well, but if, yeah, you're, I mean, no, but if you were prepared, if you thought, well, this, might ha this situation might come up, you could have a, a separate ecological area for that person, at least until they're well enough again, right? But what if you if, have more than, more nice. than one person? What if you have more than one person? Then you don't have room. You know how is it going to work? Uh, I, I think I think you have you have to you have to take on board the um, these ethical considerations and and be prepared to um, have a protocol. Yeah, but now the Antarctica what, what, situation what does seem to me to be pretty uh, analogous there because you cannot someone cannot survive outside uh, over winter in Antarctica. Uh, not even for a day. So, uh, kicking them out is not an option. And yet, I don't. I'm not aware that's ever happened. Of course, it has. Don't you remember Robert Scott? He um, he said to uh, his um, his uh, fellow expeditioners, um, "I'm going for a short walk. I may be some time." 
and just walked out the door and didn't come back. They deliberately didn't come back um, there, because there, there, wasn't, there wasn't going to be enough food. There wasn't going to be enough food if you did. Oh, okay. There so was, was there's another uh, uh, two Russians on and a base in Antarctica that um, the psychological problems of being like closed in on a base was so bad that while they were playing chess, of all things, and killed them with a chainsaw or a saw or something like that because they won the game. Yeah. Um, it's it's a it's a go to story. It was actually in a NASA briefing, which is how I learned about it. And I was like, wow, I, you know, this NASA briefing is very intense. That in the first um, two paragraphs, it mentioned a slaughterhouse example of two Russians murdering each other over a game of chess. But I'm like, I guess you know that paints a good picture of the psychological problems of deep space. Mm. Well, in any situation where you've got a, a number of a small number of people in close proximity for a long period of time in a stressful situation, I think it's 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 bound to come up. Um, we guess we, we just won't ship chainsaws to Mars, huh? Or, or vodka. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's very interesting stuff. Um, so my interest is as a as someone who's tried to write science fiction um, and uh, trying to envisage scenarios where um, you could you could set a novel and um, uh, where it wasn't totally uh, pessimistic in, in terms of what actually occurred. I, I've been very interested in the whole idea of what what sort of a minimum what would be the minimum conditions you could have. Uh, for a colony or a, a base on the moon or on Mars, if support from Earth was cut off, so, so you, you've established your Martian colony, but it's still very dependent um, presumably on, on shipping stuff from Earth. What happens if Earth stops shipping stuff? Growing food, so... Uh-oh, we lost Madison. Uh, well, hopefully she'll come back. Maybe she went off to watch The Martian just to remind herself. Of- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, well, while we're waiting, she uh, that, that's, that is just an area I'm I'm I, I've, I'm interested in the idea of setting a story in that sort of scenario. Whether you could actually have a uh, a situation where you would survive not being supported from Earth anymore, um, and I, I think you'd have to have enormously bigger. Uh, type of uh, colony than we're currently envisaging for a long, long time before you could become truly independent. Uh, I don't know. What do you think, Paul? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I th- there, there's a lot of engineering problems we haven't solved yet, clearly. Uh, okay, she's back. Uh, Hello, Madison. Hi. You there? Hello, this, Madison. Are you there? This is not the first time this has happened on this podcast, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't edit it out. Uh, but anyway, yeah. uh, yeah, you know, I, as I see it, uh, you know, we yeah, we have a lot of things. I was listening to a podcast today uh, about. Just, there you are. Can you hear us? Oh yeah, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened. Oh sorry. yeah, that happens all the time. Problem. Don't worry about it. Uh, not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, the, I, we were saying that. Uh, you know, the um, the notion of of failing to uh, you know, sorry, the podcast I was listening today was about how to grow food on Mars, and there are people at NASA thinking hard about this. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, they actually have experiments on the space station about where they they're growing veg, uh, you know, very limited scope experiments where they grow vegetables and the astronauts actually eat the vegetables uh and they're trying a lot of different different variables to see how things go but uh it's called the veggie experiment and and, uh what we're doing you know i think we're we're sort of at the baby steps level there uh but one of the scientists on this podcast uh which was uh the are we there yet podcast by the way which i recommend uh talked about uh there, there's a there's a level of in situ resource utilization. Uh, 1.0 is where you're basically all your resources come from the Earth, and you're, you're not using anything. Uh, 
but uh, less than 1.0, you're starting to grow some of your own food or produce your own food and your own energy and so on and ge generate your own fuel. And uh, that's, and you get, you get down, zero is the goal for self-sustaining. And less than zero means you're exporting. Uh, yeah. So, so that that's a. Uh, it's certainly not going to the first mission there is not going to be much less than 1.0. <laughs> maybe maybe by 0.99 they'll they'll maybe grow a, a potato or a a piece of cabbage and eat it and that will be some in situ resource utilization, but it's it's going to take a while to get to that point. It seems to me that food is actually the easy bit. Um, uh, if you grow, you know, to grow food on Mars, it's more um, where do you get to the point where you can make another shovel um, or where do you get to the, to the point where you can make another scalpel? Um, you know, the, 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 um, the, there are some huge issues there. Maybe 3D printing will become so terrific. 3D, 3D printing, actually, I know. So my, my friend that I was talking about who's an engineer, that's all he does is 3D printing for Mars. Uh -huh. Um, so that's how they're doing everything. There actually was, so I subscribe to the Google scholar alerts for like any new innovations that kind of happen. They just recently came out with all of like the medical devices that we would need, mm. um, in terms of like scalpels, knives specifically. Um, I'm obviously not a surgeon, but everything that you would need in order to do that kind of stuff, they've been able to 3d print. So that's essentially what we're going to do. And I'm actually pretty confident with, you know, the integration of 3D printing. I'm amazed at how far it's come. And um, that's where I'm like, oh, no big deal. No big deal. 3D printing, is, you know, will cover us. Well, the, the problem that we have is, and, and I think it's a solvable problem, is you have to take all these random Mars rocks and process them into materials that you can 3D print with, which... Uh, that I don't think that's that that's really just an engineering problem. When I say just an engineering problem, I mean if you put enough of the of the right talent and time and money into it, you will you will fix you will solve that. Uh, mm -hmm. But it, there's nothing nothing in the laws of physics say you can't do it. Uh, no, but, but but the difficulties are maybe bigger than we think. I mean, the, a lot of three D printing works from with plastics. Sure, and plastics are der derived from um, organic. Right. It's well, oil, but, but we're getting, moving into metals, and uh, now 3D printing is not a panacea. It's just a, it's just a manufacturing technique, uh, but it, uh, it's a very flexible manufacturing technique. It means, you know, whatever the shape is, you can you can make it if you have the material. Uh, the question is, you know, how do you get the material? Well, you've got to, since you you won't know when you arrive on Mars, you won't know exactly what the mineral composition is of your landing site. You're going to have to have a very flexible system for, you know, grinding up rocks and 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 producing, uh, producing some kind of uh, base materials from that. And that's one of the arguments for spending some time on the moon to learn how to do that kind of of thing, uh, where we can afford to fail on the moon. Uh, yeah. Uh, if, on, on Mars. Uh, we either have to bring everything we need for the entire trip or we have to, we can't fail at manufacturing. We have to be able to do something. Uh, so uh, th there, th there is a, uh, it, rather than the people who say, let's go to the moon instead of Mars, or people who say, let's go to the Mars instead of the moon, there are, there's a growing coalition that says, let's go both, both places sure. and learn how to do some of these uh, mining and, and manufacturing techniques on the moon. And uh, where where we can fail if we fail on the moon, we're a few days away from our supply chain. And yeah, and and I think I think that's yeah, like you said, it's an engineering problem. I guess from like my point, from what I know, um, from Wesley Evans, the researcher that I know, you know, in terms of the technology side of creating, you know, the three D printed material, um, in terms of what we can put on board, we're doing really well. But yet again, we just need to figure out how we can grind up these materials to be usable. 
But I, to, and this is my problem. This is the disconnect from the scientist to the engineer. I'm like, oh, you can ground up some rocks. No big deal. You know, I'm trying to figure out this virus, this very intricate virus of how to fix it in your body. Eh, it's just, you guys just ground up some rocks. Let me know how you're doing on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, yeah, I think we can figure out how to grind up rocks. Uh, <laughs> it, it may, it may take a, f- a, f- a few false starts, but we'll get it. We'll get there. Uh, yeah, biology is, is, is orders of magnitude more complex. Uh, you know, and, and uh, I think that, that is, you, it's good to point out that if people want to go to Mars, they're going to have to deal with biology as well, as well as mineralogy and, and manufacturing. Absolutely. Uh, um, but the, 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 I think, again, the, there's, a, there's a, another phase change from putting a base on Mars or putting a base on the moon to having a self-sustainable colony on, on Mars or on the moon. And, and there's probably, a, which I don't know what the answer is, but there's probably a minimum number of, of individuals you've got to have before uh, because you could if you're going to start having uh, children they then obviously there are, there are huge genetic problems if you have too small a population ah and I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just having trouble seeing how we get from where we are now to a position where we might have enough uh, enough people there to, to create something which is self-sustaining and i think and it's also having a genetically diverse population yeah. comprised of you know specific people and that's kind of the biggest thing too because from a health standpoint, you know, to have this um, solely created on people that volunteer, are we really going to be representing the genetically diverse population we need? So say like X amount of, you know, white males who are in their 40 from Anglo-Saxon descent, you know, want to go to Mars and they're otherwise, you know, healthy and fit and great and they'd be awesome to go. That's awesome. But, you know, in order for like sustainability, like you say, that wouldn't really kind of make the genetic difference that we need in order to have a sustainable population. We aren't representing everything that we need in terms of, you know, creating a colonization. No, absolutely not. Um, but then you've got to find, um, you know, volunteers uh, who do represent all those, uh, those different genetic uh, populations. Although I have to say that a country like, like the United States or like Australia is um, already a mixing, a mixing uh, pot of uh, yeah. Of, uh, well, huge I, 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 this nation. may not be a U.S. problem. Maybe a Chinese problem, or a Russian problem, or an Indian problem. Yeah, uh, they're probably more yeah. more uh, more uh, have a smaller genetic pool, I guess. Really, would, would you well, say I so? think I I don't know. I mean, uh, China, it, I think, is quite is probably more diverse than we think. Just, yeah. just as Africa is more diverse than most most people. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that's right. We, we we have a we have a very blinkered view from from where we sit. Yeah, yeah. interesting. And I I think one of the things too in terms of like health problems, looking at like India space station and the trials that they do over there, they're able to actually get so much more done, and then we are able to in the United States because they don't have as stringent you know like requirements to fulfill like. They can inject people with a virus and put them under like radiation over and over again and be like, hey, what happens? You know, because that's okay in India versus the United States where we would have to jump through so many hoops just to get like six mice, you know, to do that. And so we might see a lot of the innovation coming out of space medicine coming from India and China and not from us. That's kind of bleak, but it's true. It's kind of kind of sad, isn't it? Because they have have uh, perhaps have uh, less concern about the ethical considerations. Uh, well, I, I think as, as India gets richer, they're going to have more of that consideration. Yeah, I would say so. Um, um, and also, you know, it's a as their efforts become more and more publicly uh, worldwide, uh, you know, visible, uh, and that's true of China as well. I think. Uh, so, yeah, I'm just wondering whether you know uh, whether a, a more centrally directed uh, uh, totalitarian regime, although which we, we have these these days, thank goodness, very few. Uh, you know, someone who can simply order people to do things is that a better way? How <laughs> you can have a more successful space uh, program if you do that? Well, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know that you would. I mean, you know, it. it those tend to think kinds of things tend to crash and burn over over the long term. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, I mean, over short term, yeah, you you could probably bust through some of the barriers just by saying, "Hey, you know, uh, be a good soldier and and take one for the your country." You know, <laughs> and, and, and let's face it. I mean, the early astronauts were the same in the U.S. Mm. They yeah. they it, they were test pilots, and test pilots are people who do not expect to live to an old age. The the other thing the other thing is that um, even in the United States, I think uh, there've been quite a lot of uh, programs you, which used um, uh, American soldiers or, or sailors or whatever um, in what today we'd consider fairly unethical ways like uh, testing the results of exposure to uh, nuclear weapons and so on. Oh, sure. You know, yeah. It certainly happened in Australia too with the, the tests that happened in central Australia. Um, there were a lot of Australian soldiers exposed to quite high levels of radiation, let alone the Aboriginal population. Well, um, you know, if you're going to send your soldiers... Quite, quite deliberately, yeah. you know, exposed quite deliberately to see what the results would be. If you're going to send soldiers into battle where they're they're exposed to incredible danger... Why not send them into an experiment? You know, uh, the, the, if if you've just come out of a big war, there's not that much difference in the ethics. Uh, so, and as you get further and further from that war, you start to think more and more about: Should I really do this to these people? Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, what, what we went through in World War II was exposing young people to incredible hardship and danger. Mm. And they died, and you know they died by the millions. And and if they didn't die, they suffered um, post traumatic stress disorder uh, in the millions too. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, they called it shell shock. And, back I, then. and I think I think one of the discussions we need to start having is we have to one hundred percent, like you said, expect people to die, and and that's going to be a very difficult protocol to write and a difficult. You know, thing to enact and thing to tell the American people, because um, the Mars mission is becoming something that children say. You know, this is a possibility in your lifetime that you could see this, and starting to say, you, American people, Australian people, the world, you need to expect that there is a possibility, a very high possibility, that no one is going to come home, and it's not going to be like the Apollo missions where you know we make it to the moon and come back and have a celebration and parade. You know, we 100% could have a funeral. And that's something that is very, very likely. Um, and it, in the Mars mission most likely doesn't have a happy ending, but exploration needs to go forward without a happy ending in order for us to move science forward. All right. Well, we I lost, think that's, yeah. yeah. We lost 14 people on the shuttle program. Yeah, for, did. for no right. for no obvious gain in, in space exploration, uh, we we lost three people yeah. on the Apollo. Uh, we were lucky not to lose more. And, and the Russians, the Russians, of course, have lost people too in space. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, it's not a new idea, but yeah, we can't make it too. We can't be Pollyannish about it, thinking uh, these folks are not taking any risk. They are taking a lot of risk. Hmm. Just as just That's as. The, po the Polynesians and the yeah. Vikings and everybody else took risk when they moved out into new places. Mm. And, and I think it's just changing the conversation a little bit because, you know, a lot of, I mean, the reason why I got involved in this is because of how inspirational a lot of the people that are getting involved with the commercial space race to Mars are to me, you know, just listening to them speak about how amazing this is going to be. Um, Mars One, listening to some of the you know candidates speak is uh, so inspirational, but really kind of changing the conversation and saying, you know, for advancement, we have to talk about the bad that's happening. Um, and I think because we are so innovation, innovation, exploration, we're and we're not talking about the bad is also the reason why like all these questions on the research roadmap that NASA laid out have not been answered and don't have researchers assigned to it and have barely been touched because we don't, we don't really want to like touch those issues yet. You know, we just want to focus on the engineering things because that is something where we can see a start and an end, right? We, we know when we can launch something successfully, but you know, controlling a disease or something is so wishy-washy that it doesn't always have an endpoint. Um, you know, vaccines don't always work. 
um, certain medications don't always do what they say they're going to do. So it's this kind of gray point in terms of innovation that we really need to look at in order to make any steps forward. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, 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 uh, go ahead. Go ahead, David. I was going to say, I think, I think you're right that that we we need to start having the conversation and having a much more realistic point of view of what what the um, the totality of the risks are. We, we as as you said, we we tend to focus on the engineering engineering risks. You know, a, a tile falls off of, of the uh, space shuttle and and it burns up into the atmosphere. That was terrible and shocking, but it was within the scope of kind of what people thought the the risk profile was. But um, uh, having a, a rash of cancers happening uh, on another world um, due to an inbuilt virus is is not something we've um, we've taken into the conversation. That's so it's, it's good that medicine is now doing that sort of thing. Yeah, let's just hope funding comes through, and then I'll continue doing it. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay, That's well, well okay, well, Madison, let me ask you: uh, What do you think the research priorities should be for NASA in this area, or for any space agency? Okay. I mean, I think it's two things. So the one thing is accelerating the duration of travel. So if we can speed up how long it takes to get to Mars, we greatly um, decrease the amount of radiation and the amount of stress that you're going through. Um, and that would actually help a lot, the human factor part of it. So if you told me tomorrow hey, we found out a way to take the mission that would normally be three years to one year. I would like high five you and and be so excited because that's actually a huge engineering problem that is would be so beneficial to me because we're doing everything for the chance that you're going to be stuck there for an eternity or you know a three-year mission back and forth. So if you were able to tell me There's a very quick way that we can get there um, to Mars, there and back, um, in case anything happens. That would fix actually a lot of the problems. So that's kind of what I would say the biggest thing in research priority would be is getting there faster. Because if you can get there faster, then you cut out the majority of problems in healthcare to a really, really great extent. So even though those problems could still exist, you're cutting them in half, which is, to me, perfect. That's fine. I can I can deal with a 50% chance of cancer. I can't deal with a 100% chance of cancer. Okay. Mm-hmm. So uh, on your own, in your own field, what do you think the, the, the priority should be? <laughs> um, well, so I think things that kill you immediately, very quickly, because, you know, some of the longer things term things like um, bone loss, bone density problems. Yeah, that's going to be a problem when you get back on earth or maybe a problem later in life. But what I would be concerned about is things that can kill you fairly quickly. So if you were to get like a so mononucleosis can enlarge your spleen to the point where your spleen can actually erupt and, you know, it can cause problems like that. So that would be um, and that can help happen within 12 days. So that would be something I would say is a problem because you would essentially say, okay, well, in 12 days, we would have X amount of people dying because their spleen all enlarged. Um, and that's that's kind of what I would do. Any health problem that would kill somebody off in a time span under than a month um, after you know activation or things like that, that's where I would focus all the kind of medical research. So if honestly, if I was the main funding source, I would say, hey, it's really great. We're looking at, you know, okay, you go to the International Space Station and then it's 60 years after you get on Earth, you have bone density problems. Yeah, that's that's a problem. But that's also a problem for so many other people who don't go to the ISS. So let's stop focusing on the problems that are going to affect people after they safely get on earth, you know, 60 years from now, even longitudinally, like from an epidemiology perspective, we we can't predict that data well to begin with retrospectively. Like it's very difficult to hold that kind of population. So I would say, look at things that could cause a problem immediately. 
could kill a large, large amount of the population immediately and focus your research on that because we're not going to really care if we get people on earth and then 60 years later they have, you know, uh, crippled bones and they have to be in a wheelchair. Hey, they got to Mars. That would be amazing. I don't care if I'm in a wheelchair. But let's focus on the fact that they could die within 12 days because their spleen enlarged and we can't do anything about that. Okay. Mm. What do you guys think? Mm. Uh, well, that that, yeah, I, I think we should identify all those risks if, if, if at all possible. But, I mean, you, there's, there's uh, often been the case with um, Antarctic expeditions and so on that people have their appendices removed, uh, appendixes removed uh, before going, don't they, so that they don't come down with appendicitis. Um, do we send people to, to Mars with their spleens removed? Uh, it's a bit, <laughs> bit more drastic, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's a very without a spleen. Question, yeah, Sorry? it's it's a very interesting question, you know, um, in terms of I've actually looked at that as well um, in terms of would we send people with, you know, so one of the things that a researcher that I talked to down at Baylor College of Medicine, her name is Dorit Donneville. She is a pharmacologist. She's basically working on the protective factors that we can employ. Um, so she's basically saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if we had a shot that we could give somebody that basically pumped up your immune system before you went on board? That way your immune system is like hyperactive. It's doing really well. Kind of what we do for people that got exposed to HIV and we need to get rid of um, HIV whenever you have to go through that kind of therapy very quickly. Um, some nurses have to go through it because they might be exposed from like blood from patients and things like that. So what if we could do something like that? So when these nurses and things like that get exposed to this virus, like HIV, they go through this immune therapy to basically try to pump up their immune system and things like that, get rid of, um, flush away the virus. What if we, we were able to create something like that where we say, okay, before you go on your mission, here's a shot, you know, pumps up your immune system, and then you're, you're good to go. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what we're looking for from a pharmacological intervention, other than taking out like people's body parts, which would be less optimal ethically, okay. amongst other things. But, um, you know, what if we can just give you a shot, your immune system is, you know, really, really ready to go. And then we don't even have to worry about potentially taking out these um, body parts or things like mm -hmm. that. I, I, uh, it's, uh, this is probably from the point of view of total ignorance, but uh, is, is it at all feasible to develop a, a, a vaccine for Epstein-Barr virus? Oh, I'm glad you asked me that because this is a point of contention in the research that I'm working um, that a couple of the researchers I'm working with. So there's a researcher, Hank Balfour. He's at University of Minnesota. He's been working on the vaccine since 19... I, Sorry, I got him on since that yeah. when, sir? Yeah, and, and let me tell you this. Um, we, we don't have a vaccine, so that kind of tells you how we're doing with the research. So the problem with Epstein-Barr is two things. One problem is people don't really see it as a problem. So because everybody has it, lives with it, and it doesn't really cause any controversy, um, we, don't, we can't get funding to get the vaccine up because they're like, oh, why, why would we care about EBV? Like with cervical cancer in terms of HPV, we mm. were able to get that because we can make the association really quickly and scare people like, oh, you, you really don't want cervical cancer. That's very, very bad. Mm. So, you know, we get all that funding for research because EBV um, is so like, oh, no, no big deal. You're just going to get mono. Every, every kid gets mono or kids get mono in college, you know. Um, things like that, sharing drinks, no big deal. No one really thinks it's a problem. And and there was the same problems that went through that researchers who um, did the chickenpox thing went through because they essentially had to convince people that, you know, if you don't get the chickenpox vaccine, then you are going to get shingles, which could really hurt you later in life. But this, you know, the generation gap of saying, Oh, well, you just get chicken pox. It's something everyone gets. You get it once and then it's no big deal. You never get it again. And so that is kind of the problem, the quandary that we're going through is we have to convince people 
that yes, EBV is a problem. Yes, give us money to get a vaccine running because no one because no one sees it as a problem and because even though it was the first cancer virus ever found, it's really kind of academia that understands that um, and not the broader population. We can't get that funding to create the vaccine. So that's kind of what they're having as a problem. Mm. The second problem is, it is very, very difficult to represent in models. So um, humanized mice don't do well with EBV. There's, um, we can test in a very certain type of um, monkey that's actually, that monkey is about to go extinct. So now we can't test on it anymore. Mm. So um, all of our models that we use that aren't human are either don't hold the virus or going extinct. So we're kind of at an end where unless we had human models and we could start testing on humans to create a vaccine, we're we're at a point that we can't really do anything until we improve humanized mice models. Mm. That's very interesting. Um, Depressing, but (laughs) very interesting. Mm. Well, uh, I know I'm just I'm, I'm so glad I get to talk about this because this is like. I love this stuff. You know, this is what my (laughs) life's work is. And, you know, whenever I try to bring this to dinner parties and things like that, and people just look at me like I'm (laughs) absolutely crazy and, you know, talking about space viruses and then monkeys and vaccines and death. And, you know, I'm not a really great dinner party guest, but it's (laughs) great to hear people that are interested in this. Yeah, (laughs) we're glad glad you did come here and talk about it. (laughs) You've suddenly given us a lot of food for thought. Yeah, <laughs> we'll have to have you back in a year or so to let us, let us give us an update. Let us know how you're going. Yeah, that's, that's right. It's really interesting. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Uh, well, I think we, we, we're probably just about wind, winding up here. Are you happy with that, Paul? If we, uh, we, 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 uh, we wind up here. So um, I'll, uh, I'll thank Madison Campbell very much indeed for coming to talk to us today on the Unseen Podcast and uh, Paul Carr for, for joining us. Thanks, Paul, for letting me have the, the chance to host again. Oh, well, th- thank you for for pick, taking up the reins, David. I uh, I appreciate it. I haven't had a lot of time to do this sort of thing lately. That's no, all right. I'm sure I'll get better at it uh, if if, uh, if Google uh, and the, the tools uh, improve a little. We had a bit of trouble at the start. Never mind. <laughs> all right. So uh, that's that's uh, all from us. And uh, so uh, goodbye to Madison. Bye. Thank you guys so much. I so appreciate talking to you and I will keep you updated with everything going on. Um, And I'll let you know in a year if we somehow have fixed the virus problem. But I tell you, it's going to, I'm hoping one day to get a conversation with Elon Musk where I just tell him, hey, Elon, you you really need to worry about these viruses. It's going to be a problem. Your stock is going to go down like PayPal. (laughs) I, I look forward to you having that conversation with him. I think it'll be terrific. Okay. Uh, and so it's, uh, and thank you, Paul. Um, yeah. And uh, it's goodbye for many. This is David Greek. So thanks to all. See you later. Thank you.